This presentation is on Chapter 22, Part B. This is dealing with the respiratory system. And this uh, portion will deal with some of the physiology, what, some of the mechanics of the breathing. Uh, first, inspiration is the flowing of gas into the lungs, and expiration is the flowing of gas out of the lungs. A lot of it is determined by pressure, uh, differences between atmospheric pressure and then the pressure that's found in the lungs itself. So atmospheric pressure, that is the pressure that's exerting surrounding the body. Um, if you measure it, it's 760 millimeters of HG at sea level. Um, when we talk about different pressures in the body, we do it relative to what the atmospheric pressure is. So if when we're discussing like negative or positive respiratory pressures. It's compared to that atmospheric pressure. If it is less than the 760, which is atmospheric, then that's considered negative. If it's greater than the atmospheric pressure, then it's positive. Zero pressure would mean that it's equal to what the atmospheric pressure is. So <coughs> Excuse me. So in terms of measuring the pressure within different areas of the body, uh, Intrapulmonary pressure, that's the pressure in the alveoli. Remember, that's where the gas exchange is occurring. Um, this pressure can fluctuate during the breathing process and eventually wants to equalize with that atmospheric pressure. Intrapleural pressure is the pressure in the pleural cavity. Remember, that is surrounding the lungs. That pressure is also going to fluctuate with uh, breathing, but it's always... Um, a negative pressure. So it's always going to be less than the pulmonary pressure. It's going to be less than the uh, atmospheric pressure. You want fluid in that cavity to be kept at a very low minimum. If fluid does start to accumulate there, then what happens is the pressure in the pleural cavity, this intrapleural pressure, uh, would start to increase. What's the end result is that you would have a collapsed lung. The intrapleural uh, pressure helps to promote certain things. Uh, you, you obviously do not want the, the lungs to collapse. Um, the natural tendency for the lungs, because of their elasticity, is they want to try to recoil, become the, the smallest size. And you don't want that to happen. They have to be able to move. And then you've got surface tension of the alveoli fluid. Um, so those things are working against it to try to have the pressure to enlarge the lungs. Um, you're going to see movement of the thoracic cage. The volume of that is going to change. So you have opposing forces here. Some things are trying to increase the pressure. Some are trying to decrease the pressure. And so they're, these opposing forces are working together uh, to maintain the proper pressure within that pleural cavity. Transpulmonary pressure, uh, this is the pressure that's going to keep those lung spaces open and keep the lungs from collapsing. <coughs> so on this diagram just shows a schematic drawing of once again where the thoracic wall is, where the pleural cavity is, where the lungs are, and atmospheric pressure in the inner relationships um, that have to occur if, bottom line is, if you have a, a change in pressure, gases, etc., are always going to want to flow from high pressure to low pressure. And this is going to assist with the breathing process. When you talk about the, and you may see this in your work career, I have a collapsed lungs, and when you talk about that and what's happening, why does this happen, maybe the bronchioles are plugged. Uh, pneumothorax is when you have air that's in that pleural cavity. Uh, typically, it happens because of a wound. If you have a wound to the chest, the wound extends down to the pleural cavity. Air is able to flow in. That air atmospheric uh, pressure that now is trying to equalize with the pleural pressure, what's going to happen is 
as that air is rushing in, the lungs are going to collapse. So how would you treat that? Well, you've got to get the air out of that pleural cavity. So typically you would insert a, a chest tube, remove the air. Once the pleural have healed, then the, the lung will then reinflate. Why? Because you've now got the change in the pressure again. And that's what this is showing pneumothorax, which is that essentially collapsed lung. Uh, why? Because you have air in the pleural cavity. So pulmonary ventilation, that's the combination of basically inhaling and exhaling, bringing gas into the lungs and moving gas out of the lungs. How does this occur? Well, pressure and volume are related. Um, your volume changes. If you change the volume of something, go from, an, say, a large volume, to a smaller volume, the pressure is going to change as well. Um, and what's happening is, remember with diffusion where things go from an area of high concentration to an area of low concentration in the liquid? Think of it as a very similar thing. Gases want to go from high pressure to low pressure. So what happens when you are breathing is the various muscles are going to be contracting, as we'll see in a moment. When you inhale, what is happening is the thoracic cage is actually going to move up, and that's going to change the volume of the thoracic cavity. It moves up and out, increasing the volume. They're inverse. As you increase volume, pressure will decrease. So what happens is, and the pressure is lower than what atmospheric pressure is, so air is going to naturally want to flow in through the nasal cavity, down the trachea, through the bronchial tubes, and into the lungs, because it's wanting to equalize that pressure. When you exhale, essentially what is happening is now some of those muscles are relaxing. The thoracic cage is going to move down and inward thereby decreasing the volume of the thoracic cavity. Once again, volume and pressure are inverse or opposite. So if you decrease the volume, you increase the pressure. Now the pressure is higher than the atmospheric pressure. So where does the gas want to go? From high to low. So it's going to go out of the lungs as you exhale it, trying to equalize towards the atmospheric pressure. In a nutshell, that is what a respiration is all about. There are uh, different chemistry and physics laws, such as Boyle's Law, that, that deal with these relationships. And as I said, pressure and volume are going to be inverse or opposite. So as one increases, the other will decrease. So like I was just saying, your inspiration, or when you inhale, the diaphragm is going to contract. You have the intercostal muscles that are also contracting the external intercostals. And all of this is resulting in an increase in that thoracic volume, which means the pressure decreases. You are increasing the size of the lungs, stretching them out so that they can hold all of this additional air. Um, sometimes there are other accessory muscles that can also uh, help increase the thoracic cage volume, especially when you go to take in a very deep breath. Or certain people with different respiratory problems that have to breathe deeper will use additional muscles such as the scalenes or pectoralis minor, etc., um, that will help to increase that size, allowing a greater di pressure uh, difference. In other words, increasing um, the difference between the atmospheric uh, pressure and the pressure in the lungs so that you can take even more air in. So this is kind of a step-by-step -step, uh, diagram showing the events and the order that they happen and the diagram of that thoracic cage where you can see it is changing shape. Increase the volume of the thoracic cavity. When you exhale, essentially, it's the, the opposite process. It's considered passive because the muscles are relaxing. Once again, that thoracic cavity, the volume is going to decrease. The lungs are going to recoil, 
or get smaller, the air is going to flow out of the lungs. And that is shown in this diagram. This is another diagram along with a graph and just time out the differences between the intrapulmonary pressure, the intrapleural pressure, the volume of air that you are taking in. Uh, the main thing is just to realize once again air is going, the gases are going to flow down their uh, pressure gradients so it's always going to go from high pressure to low pressure and that's essentially what's allowing it to flow either in or out and pressure is inverse to volume. What are some non-respiratory air movements because there are some things other than breathing which will help uh, move air and it may interfere with your normal uh, breathing rhythm. Uh, most of these are reflex actions, so most of them are not voluntary, though there are some that can be voluntary. Coughing, sneezing, laughing, hiccups, yawning, things like that. There are three physical factors that help to play a role in how well um, the air passage allows air flowing through it, the amount of energy that's going to be required, and that's things such as airway resistance, AVOL surface tension, and lung compliance. Airway res resistance is just referring to things like friction. Um, is there anything that's um, impeding the airflow? So gas flow is going to change once again uh, with resistance. As the resistance increases, the gas flow is going to decrease. So it's a reverse. Um, so diameter is going to play a role. If you decrease the diameter of the air passage, such as in the bronchial, if you decrease that diameter of it, you're increasing the resistance, which means you're decreasing the amount of airflow that can go through there. This is something that happens, say, with someone who has asthma. If the bronchial tubes start to, there's a trigger in an asthma attack, and typically what will happen is those bronchial tubes will constrict. So the diameter gets much smaller. And that's why you often hear that wheezing is someone's trying to increase the amount of airflow in. They're having to take deeper breaths. They're having to breathe uh, at a faster rate. The medications that, they that an asthmatic would take are bronchial dilators, meaning it will increase the diameter of those passageways so that there's less resistance so now the air can flow faster and more air will flow through. When you reach down to the terminal bronchioles near the alveoli sacs, you have very little resistance. Part of the reason is you have so much branching that occurs. It's kind of like you're spreading all that air out. And now the air is going to move by uh, diffusion. So this is what I was time out with an asthmatic or even someone who is exercising strenuously. Uh, the resistance is going to increase, therefore that's going to have an effect on the amount of uh, airflow. And once again, it's the inverse. In terms of surface tension at the alveoli, surface tension is the attraction of liquid, uh, one liquid molecule to another right at the gas liquid surface. Um, the water tends to have a very high uh, surface tension and the problem with if it was just water by itself in the alveoli there would be a problem because it would turn the alveoli to shrink and back basically collapse so to counteract this the body makes a surfactant um, it's kind of a lipid uh, waxy protein complex and it helps to reduce the surface tension therefore it prevents the alveoli from collapsing from a clinical standpoint what might you see in terms of deficiencies with the surfactant this is one concern certainly with especially premature infants um, oftentimes they are not adequately making that surfactant yet and so there is uh, concern that the alveoli can collapse after every breath that they take and it 
puts the infant into infant respiratory distress syndrome. How will they treat that? They can spray either a natural synthetic surfactant. They may uh, put the infant um, on oxygen with pressure so they can keep a positive pressure to help keep those AVI low, um, from collapsing, keep them open. Lung compliance just means a measure on the change in the lung volume. Um, how much can the lungs stretch and then recoil back? Normally they can stretch fairly high, um, which is good. It helps increase the amount of air that you can take in. Things that can reduce the compliance is if there is scar tissue that is replacing the actual lung tissue. Think of the lung as a huge sponge. And so if you replace some of that spongy material with fibers that cannot um, allow for space to take in the extra air so you can have the oxygen and CO2 exchange occurring, that's going to decrease your overall lung capacity. Um, some individuals, sometimes with aging, if there's less, less flexibility of the thoracic cage, obviously with every breath, you're not going to be increasing the volume as much in the thoracic cavity. And that means there's not going to be as big of a difference in the pressure between the pressure in the lungs versus the atmosphere, which means less air would be uh, flowing in. And typically in that case, the way an individual is going to compensate is they would have more shallow breathing and faster rates. There are different ways of assessing the volume, and some of this relates to the lab exercises that uh, correspond to this, where you have the spirometer and you're able to take these different readings or else watch the video link um, and then do the, the appropriate corresponding worksheet on it. So I'm going to go through this fairly quickly. Um, why would you be measuring these different volumes? It gives you an idea of uh, what is the capacity of the lungs of the patient. Has it been diminished? Is it compromised in some way? Can help you with diagnosing is there some type of a respiratory disorder that the individual ex is experiencing? So you're looking at what is the capacity of the lungs? How much volume can it hold? Spirometer is um, the equipment that we use for measuring the amount of volume. Uh, once again, this is done in lab. So just kind of quickly, tidal volume is the amount of air that during normal breathing is moving in and out with each breath. The IRV, inspiratory reserve volume, is the amount of air that can be forcibly basically inhaled beyond that tidal volume. The ERV, Expiratory reserve volume is the amount of air that can be forcibly exhaled from the lungs. And the residual volume is the amount of air that always remains in the lungs. There's always going to be some air in the lungs. When you exhale, you do not completely remove all the air from the lungs. It's kind of like, once again, think of the lungs as a sponge. When you put water on it and you soak it, you may wring that sponge, but I don't care. You're never going to get all the water out of it. Same thing with the lungs. You're never going to remove all of the, the air. Why is that important? Because you need to keep the alveoli open. And so that air that remains in the lungs is referred to as your residual volume. You can calculate different um, respiratory volumes beyond those initial ones I just mentioned by doing simple math whether it's adding some of them together, um, and those are listed here, such as the vital capacity, or what is the total lung capacity? What's the sum of all of the different volumes? And this is uh, showing a graph. This is uh, for a male where they did measures, and you can see um, how the different volumes basically relate to each other such as the total lung capacity is all of those, the IRV, the, the TV, the ERV, and the RV all together. And this is some comparison of an adult male with an adult female, just averages. Obviously, like anything, these are going to vary depending on um, 
how athletic a person is. It's going to depend on their age. Is there a predisposing uh, medical condition? Obviously, someone with asthma it would be different than somebody that does not have asthma. So these are just averages. Dead space, uh, sometimes they refer to the total dead space, which is composed of the two uh, components, anatomical dead space. This is area that, such as air that's remaining in the passageways. And then the alveoli dead space, uh, some of the alveoli may be collapsed, they may be blocked, and so they're not contributing with the respiration at that point in time. Alveoli ventilation rate, or AVR, is the flow of gas in and out of the alveoli at any particular time. And that's going to take into account, is there the total volume, what's the rate of breathing, is there any dead space? And so it takes all those factors into consideration, gives you a little bit of a better idea of what the overall efficiency of the breathing with respiratory volumes, etc., are for the patient. And this, once again, just gives, um, over on the left-hand side, three different cases of different breathing rates, whether it's normal, whether it's slow, rapid, etc., in comparison of what some of these measurements would be and how effective is basically the breathing rate. In terms of the gas exchange, external respiration, this is the gas exchange that is occurring between the blood and the lungs. Internal respiration is the exchange of gases between the blood and the tissues elsewhere in the body. So once again, another law from both chemistry and physics is just Dalton's law of partial pressures. Um, so when you have different gases, they're exerting different pressures. All that adds up to the total pressure. Partial pressure is referring to what we're going to be looking at is what is the partial pressure of oxygen versus partial pressure of carbon dioxide. So we're going to be looking at, um, because we're talking about exchange like from blood to lungs, the partial pressure of, say, oxygen in the lungs to partial pressure of oxygen in the blood. What is the difference there? And once again, this goes through the actual measurements of, of what that is, how you can calculate what the partial pressure is in atmospheric air for both oxygen and um, carbon dioxide. Just keep in mind that these pressures, they calculate them at sea level. So as you go up in altitude, so if you were to travel up in the mountains, the partial pressure is going to decrease in the atmosphere. As you go lower, in other words, if you're a diver, you'd be very familiar with this, that the partial pressure increases significantly. You, if you're a scuba diver, you know you have to account for that. Henry's Law just um, says that gas is going to dissolve in a liquid relative to what the partial pressure is. Ideally, you're going to want, um, if you have something, a gas in, say, the atmosphere versus gas in the liquid, they're going to want to equalize, essentially what it's saying. Um, carbon dioxide uh, is more prevalent in the alveolar. Part of it has to do with the mixing of gases, etc., the temperature. And this is a comparison of listing the gases such as nitrogen, oxygen, carbon dioxide, and then water. It gives what the partial pressure is at sea level in the atmosphere, and then over on the right gives the partial pressure of those same gases in the alveoli. So just by looking at this table, if things want to move from high pressure to low pressure, some of the remaining slides are going to show this, but this table, I feel, is very clear. Look at the oxygen, the O2. If atmospheric partial pressure is 159, but in the alveoli it's only 104, it wants to go from high to low. So the oxygen is going to flow when you inhale. It's going to want to flow naturally from the atmosphere into the alveoli. 
So that means when you in inhale, yes, guess what? That oxygen is coming in and it's going to want to exchange. But look at CO2, carbon dioxide. Atmosphere, it's 0 0.3 versus in the alveoli, it's 40. So the carbon dioxide is going to want to naturally flow from the alveoli out because it's wanting to equalize. It goes from high to low. So that's what this is, time of external respiration, is that exchange of oxygen and CO2 in the lungs. And what I was just saying, it's, it's going, you have such a change, it's such a difference in the numbers. Oxygen is going to want to flow into the blood. CO2 is going to want to flow out from the, the blood out into the lungs so that you can then exhale it. And this diagram or picture is showing, once again, differences in, if you look in the upper left, inspired air, see how large that red bar on the graph is? That's for oxygen. And if you compare it over on the upper right, because um, we're looking, this is comparison in those alveolar sacs. The red bar is less. So on the, the left, it's the atmospheric air, the air that you breathed in that's traveling down through the trachea to the primary bronchial, secondary bronchial, tertiary, and finally terminal bronchi into the alveolar. That partial pressure of the oxygen uh, in this exam is giving is around 160. That bar is fairly high, that red bar. But look on the right and it's lower. That is in the alveol, the blood, in the capillaries there. So how is it going to flow? It wants to equalize. So oxygen's flowing in. Look, the blue bar is for CO2, and it is exchanging in the opposite direction. When you look down at the tissue level, you can see the opposite is going to occur. So in this case, in the tissues, you have the CO2 is high. It's going to flow into the blood. The oxygen is higher in the blood, so it's going to flow out of the blood. And this is what you need to have, the exchange at the tissue level, because the tissues need the oxygen. They need to get rid of that CO2, which is a waste product. So there are different things that can affect this, such as uh, the membranes, how thick are they, what's total surface area, um, how much blood, how quickly is it moving through. The bottom line is that, yes, in the lungs for external respiration, the oxygen is flowing into the blood, CO2 is flowing out of the blood. How can you change this? Well, this is in terms of the rate. Um, it's involuntary. There are, are respiration control centers in the brain, if you remember, that can control the rate of your breathing. How would it control the amount of oxygen that can be exchanged? Well, part of it has to do with um, changing. Remember the capillary beds? You can change the diameter of the arterioles just prior to where it feeds into that capillary bed. So if you increase the diameter, you increase the blood flow, which means you can increase the uh, amount of surface area of blood that's passing through for increased levels of, of the exchange of oxygen. Another way that you could control it um, is by changing the diameter of your bronchial tubes so that in the breathing process you can get more air in. So that's essentially what this is talking about. You can, if the oxygen levels in the alveoli are high already, um, you can adjust the arterioles, you can dilate them, you can constrict them. If the pressure of the CO2 starts to change, the way the body can adjust is change your breathing rate. 
change the diameter of the bronchioles, dilate them or constrict them. If you dilate them, then you can start to get rid of CO2 more quickly. And that's what this picture is showing. Once again, how you can adjust the capillaries, the amount of blood flow through there by changing the diameter on the arterial side. So you increase or decrease the amount of blood flow through the capillary bed, which means you're either increasing or decreasing the amount of gas exchange that's occurring there. Internal respiration involves the exchange between the blood and the rest of the body tissues. Once again, it's going to be uh, controlled by pressure changes. So as I mentioned earlier on this graph down at the bottom, that at the tissue level, oxygen's flowing out of the blood into the tissues, carbon dioxide's flowing out of the tissues and into the blood.